I'm delighted to, uh, to be here today to share with you um, some information about the project that we do in the School of Law at the University of Bristol, which we think is having a big impact not only on individual lives, but also in terms of uh, sensitising, um, well, society about uh, a problem which we thought was, was, was already resolved uh, with the setting up of the Criminal Cases Review Commission. This is the body which... Um, reviews alleged or suspected miscarriage of justice cases which were set up off the back of the Birmingham Six and the Guildford Four cases. But the research that we've done at Bristol has shown that um, the CCRC is not uh, the answer to, uh, to the problem and we're still seeking a solution to the wrongful conviction of innocent people. Um, <clears throat> the Innocence Network UK and the vehicle through which we do casework, um, it'll become a little bit clearer as I go through the slides, uh, the University of Bristol Innocence Project are um, practical outgrowths of academic research on the problem of, of wrongful convictions. And the overall aim, we're not at, uh, in conflict with the criminal justice system, the overall aim of both the Innocence Network UK and the Innocence Projects, of which there are now almost 30 in the United Kingdom in just five or six years since we set up the first one at Bristol, um, is to improve the criminal justice system. The way you improve the system is not just by criticising it, it's by unearthing cases which exemplify the errors with the system. So the, the Innocence Network UK and its member Innocence Projects that work on the cases, to me is a machinery for working on alleged wrongful conviction cases, in a sense as public inquiries to find out the truthfulness or otherwise of these claims of innocence with a view to getting evidence that we can feed back into the system, learn lessons from what went wrong and make the system better. Some of the key research um, findings, um, this is basically from, from the academic research that I've been doing over the last 10 years on, on miscarriages of justice, is that I've already just mentioned the Birmingham Six and the Guildford Four, and these cases are very familiar to us. Uh, whenever we have a, a debate or a, a dialogue about miscarriage of justice, we always keep revisiting these same cases. But if the Birmingham Six, for example, and the Guildford Four, they were both convicted, these people in these cases, in 1973, you know, 30 years ago. If these were the only cases that occurred, they would indeed be exceptional. But they're not. Today, in England and Wales, 20 people will overturn uh, a, a criminal conviction in an appeal court, either in a, the Crown Court sitting as a court of appeal for convictions given in a magistrate's court, or in the court of appeal itself, uh, for convictions given in Crown Court. So from that perspective, successful appeals against criminal conviction, if that's taken as an indicator of an official acknowledgement that a criminal conviction is, is wrongful or erroneous, they're very, very routine things. They happen every single day. But despite this, despite the fact that there are thousands of successful appeals each year, the prison and parole systems work on the basis that all prisoners are guilty, or they did do up until recently. There has been a change in response to uh, our engagements with uh, the Ministry of Justice. Um, but they work on the basis that the, the decisions of the courts are always correct. That's problematic. I'm trying to set the context for the work that we do. And as a result, I mean, this is a real political aspect to the work that we're doing. Uh, there are thousands of prisoners at the moment, and this is official data from the parole board. There are thousands of prisoners in prison maintaining innocence that are not making any progress through their sentence from A, B, C, D to out. They're making no progress in their sentences and they're not being released. Each year, or every, sorry, every two years, they're assessed by prison psychology, by prison officers, by the parole board, and they're not getting out. Most of them are past their tariffs, the time that they could have been released. And on our books, Innocence Network UK, we've got 200 life sentence prisoners maintaining innocence. We're working on 87 of those cases, mostly for murder, who actually are way past their tariffs and they're not making any progress whatsoever. <clears throat> The prison and parole systems work on the basis that if people are in prison who are innocent, the courts will deal with it. The Court of Appeal or the Criminal Case Review Commission, this body that I mentioned, was set up to review alleged wrongful conviction cases. They don't. The main stumbling block with the criminal appeal system and the CCRC is that they work on the basis that if the evidence of your innocence was available at the time of your original trial or could have been made available at the time of your original trial, that doesn't mean that you didn't have a fair trial. Criminal appeals are about process, they're not about innocence. Innocence isn't grounds for appeal. You've got to show that there's something, you know, untoward with your conviction, uh, with the procedures that led to your conviction. 
And so what we're seeing now is that people are presenting evidence of innocence to the courts, but it's not being accepted. So people are stuck in prison maintaining innocence who are innocent. Um, <clears throat> so the Innocence Network UK, we set it up in September 2004, uh, and we do three things. We facilitate casework by referring eligible cases to member innocence projects. And as I've said, we've now got almost 30 innocence projects in the UK working on 87 cases. <clears throat> About 500 staff and students working with pro bono lawyers, forensic scientists are giving their time pro bono, uh, senior police officers are participating in the project, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also do research, and I'd argue that the research that we're doing with the Innocence Network UK and colleagues who are actually using the kind of data that Innocence Network UK is generating, because each year we have an end of year report from the Innocence Projects, which tell us the hot spots where we need to actually be looking, where we need to be researching, what's getting in the way of them trying to investigate or overturn an alleged wrongful conviction case. So it's not a blue skies research agenda, it's a meaningful and I'd say urgent research agenda which is actually being generated by Innocence Network UK. And communications, you know, like today and, and like, think, you know, we, we have regular meetings and engagements with the Parole Board, with the Ministry of Justice, with the Criminal Case Review Commission uh, not always easy uh, conversations, but nonetheless we are seeing um, things happening. What do Innocence Projects do? Well, in a nutshell, you've got students who are investigating the cases. As I said, they're akin to public inquiries. We want to know if people who are claiming to be innocent are innocent or not. Um, and, you know, they work under academic supervision and with guidance from pro bono lawyers. <clears throat> Progress to date. I've put 20 plus there. It's fluctuating. There are almost 30 innocence projects, and there's one which isn't in a university. It's in a barrister's chambers in London. Um, and I think that there are kind of um, there are signs that the innocence projects are going to deliver what I was hoping that they would. Uh, it's take, there is always a kind of lag, I think, inevitably, when you set up a new venture, between starting to learn how to work on the cases properly and then seeing, you know, seeing something positive coming from that. But at the moment, we've got, collectively as a, as a network, eight cases under review at the Criminal Cases Review Commission, one under review at the uh, uh, Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission, and there's one case which has been referred by the CCRC back to the Court of Appeal, and that's going to be heard in December in 2010. A couple of case studies from the University of Bristol Innocence Project, um, Simon Hall. Simon Hall is the case which is going to be uh, in the Court of Appeal in, in December. And the University of Bristol Innocence Project, over the last four or five years, have done significant work on this case. The main evidence against him was fibre evidence. It was the first case in the United Kingdom where fibre evidence led to the conviction for someone for, for murder. No other evidence uh, uh, whatsoever. We've systematically uh, undermined the reliability of that fibre evidence. I can't go into any great detail, but I can happily talk to people about it on the stand uh, today. We made various other submissions to the CCRC about the possibility of using new and advanced DNA testing techniques on exhibits which exist from the crime scene which can again determine whether he's innocent and we looked in the unused evidence and we found statements from witnesses uh, which again if developed properly can prove his factual innocence. <clears throat> Another case which is under review at the CCRC at the moment is the case of Neil Hurley. And it's a fascinating case because, and I think it really signals the, the failures of the CCRC. The CCRC has looked at this case three times and refused to refer it back to the Court of Appeal. Yet the students at Bristol unearthed uh, of evidence of over 120 exhibits from the crime scene where Sharon Pritchard was murdered. Clothing, stones with blood on them, pieces of wood with blood on them, which she'd probably been hit to death with. Uh, belts, underwear, 120 exhibits from the crime scene, never ever been subjected to any DNA testing whatsoever. Despite the fact that when the police announced the, the murder of Sharon Pritchard in the first ever interview in 1993, he's been in prison now 17 years, they said that they were going to have these things tested to find out who the murderer was. Two days later, Neil Hurley was charged with murder. Uh, and the rest is history. We've identified suspects in that case that we want testing as well. Because not only do we think we might be able to prove Neil Hurley's innocence, we may also be able to find the real perpetrator of that murder. 
I've said a little bit about research. I'm running out of time, but we don't only do academic publications. We do non a lot of non-academic publications which we feed into uh, the media, into prisoners' groups, into third sector, uh, public sector groups. And we've had a lot of interest from the media. There's been a few TV programmes made about it. We're working with the BBC at the moment on a one-hour programme on Neil Hurley's case. Um, and I think most significantly today in, in a policy sense is, is the impact that we've had on the Ministry of Justice, the National Offender Management Service. I said earlier that they've always worked on the basis that all prisoners are guilty. <clears throat> but that was a notion of legal guilt. And we've clarified with them that when prisoners are saying they're innocent, they're talking in a kind of language of, of factual innocence. Whereas what the prison and the parole systems are talking is a discourse of legal innocence and legal guilt. All prisoners maintaining innocence are legally guilty. They've just been convicted by a court. But some of them may be factually innocent. And MISA, which is called Managing Indeterminate Sentences and Risks, is the training programme that NOMS, National Offender Management Service in the Ministry of Justice, actually trains 30,000 prison and probation staff who work with prisoners maintaining innocence. And they've started to adopt our methodology now, the methodology that I devised for the Innocence Network UK in um, deciding eligibility of cases in their dealings with such prisoners. So now they also ask for a narrative of innocence and they start to try and identify what the precise claim of innocence is about. And together, we're able to actually tell about 80, 85% of people who claim innocence that they're not innocent and why they're not innocent. Reasons are ignorance of criminal law, they maintain innocence so they've got a chance of winning an appeal. People often think that the things that they do shouldn't be a crime, so that they say they're innocent. Animal rights campaigners, people who have sex with children, don't think it should be a crime because the age of consent is less in other countries. The way ahead, just to kind of finish off, <clears throat> it's been fantastic, you know, this kind of explosion in innocence projects, both in terms of the number of innocence projects that we've got in universities, the number of cases which are being worked on, the number of people that are actually participating in this project. The problem is that we are struggling. We're struggling to make this sustainable. So we are hoping to talk to people today about how we can raise funding, both to make this venture sustainable, but also to separate from the casework referral aspects, the research and policy aspects, so that we can actually set up a centre that can start to really push forward and capitalise upon all of the research possibilities that are coming out of the work that we're doing. So I'll stop there and I'll accept questions. Thank you.